Hey everybody, it's Gauntlet X and welcome back to some more Magic Arena. Today I'll be hopping into the midweek Magic event to grab those two free random rare rewards. This week we have the future standard pre-cons to play around with. So in this event, you're not using cards from your personal collection, you're getting a sneak preview of the standard pre-cons that'll be around once uh, Eldraine and Theros and all of that rotate out of standard. These will be the new pre-constructed decks that every arena count gains. So you'll have all these cards in your collection soon enough, but for now, we get to get a little sneak preview. So each of these decks focuses around a bit of a different strategy, and they're all powerful in their own right, trying to balance them out equally to make an interesting format here. The red-white deck is focused around warriors and equipment, so a lot of cards like Scavenged Blade and Dwarven Hammer, just some great equipment there, as well as cards like Resolute Strike that lets you move that equipment around really easily. And of course, most of the creatures in this deck are warriors, the Shield Mates, the Blade Masters, and so on. So there's a bit of warrior tribal like the Cargan War Leader here, so a really aggressive Boros equipment strategy there in Armed and Dangerous. Avalanche and Green Blue is focused around Ramp and Snowlands here. So a lot of cards from Call Time in this deck. If you were interested in the Call Time limited format and you drafted a lot of Green X Snow decks, this will be right up your alley. You have Spirit of the Alder Guards in here, Sculptor of Winters, an Avalanche Caller, some Berg Striders slowing your opponents down, big old Icebreaker Kraken at the top end of the curve, and then you kind of fill out the deck with a lot of um, Strixhaven ramp cards from the Quandrix uh, colors. Zimone, Quandrix Prodigy, Quandrix Command, Quandrix Cultivators, and Eureka Moments. And then at the top end, a couple other cards to ramp into these big old bookworms. So a pretty basic green-blue snow ramp deck there. In white-black, we probably have the most classic strategy out of all of them so far this one is kind of just a blue black control deck i've had a peek through all these decks and this one didn't look particularly specific to me you just have some counter spells like you find the villain's lair some removal spells like poison the cups and flunks for cheap you have some ways to get them back from your grave the tazim royal mages to pick up your removal and your counters and a little bit of discard elder fang disciple and uh, skull raid here to disrupt your opponent's hand and try to keep them off their game plan so kind of a classic just demir control deck here but with some powerful bombs as all of the decks have in this one you have mind flayer that can steal your opponent's best creature as long as it remains on the battlefield. You also have the big old mythic dragon, Imrith, Desert, Doom, and Gelatinous Cube, another card that can clear out one of your opponent's creatures when it comes into play. So a pretty solid blue-black control deck there. Next off, in white-black, we have Dungeon Delving. This is one of the decks that focuses heaviest on the new Dungeons & Dragons cards over anything else, because the core mechanic of the set is going to be venturing in the dungeon with cards like Ranger's Hawk here, uh, digging you into that dungeon to try to complete it as quickly as possible. Um, for cards like Cloister Gargoyle, that once you've completed a dungeon becomes a 3-4 flyer for 3. Uh, Barrow In, once you've completed a dungeon, starts bringing things back from your graveyard. Um, and then your rares, Nadar, giving your whole field plus 1 plus 1 if you've completed a dungeon. And Acerac, the Arch Lich, not being able to remain on the battlefield unless you have completed the Tomb of Annihilation there. So this deck focuses pretty heavily on just speed running through Tomb of Annihilation as quickly as possible to make all of your other cards in the deck more powerful, even your removal like Precipitous Drop getting better after you've completed a dungeon. So that is one of the cool decks if you want to try out a lot of the new Dungeons & Dragons cards without having to uh, purchase a lot of them there. It gives you a big feel for the venture into the dungeon mechanic. Here in blue-red you have the Fireworks deck, another pretty classic theme for the colors, just blue-red spells really. You have cards like Umara Mystic, uh, getting plus two plus oh whenever you cast an instant sorcery or wizard. Um, cause a royal chaser, making your instants and sorceries cheaper. Prismari Pledge Mage, only being able to attack if you've cast an instant or sorcery. Some very basic classic blue red spell stuff, but you have that little bit of a Strixhaven twist like we had with the Prismari, where you do have cards like Maelstrom Muse here that help you cast really big instants and sorceries, and you have a couple of those. You've got Meteor Swarm here being a big X mana one to uh, rip out 
a bunch of creatures from your opponent's field. You have multiple choice here, being a nice 5 mana 4-4, four, four, scry 1, draw a card, bounce an opponent's creature, and you've got the big old 7 mana creative outburst, kind of a classic at this point in the Strixhaven limited format. And then uh, Farida's Fireball as well for some other big instants and sorceries. Next up we have Growing Hunter. Grow <laughs> Next up we have Growing Hunger in Golgari. This is a plus one plus one counter themed deck. You have your rares like Grackmaw and Oran Reef Ooze, giving you benefits for having a lot of stuff with plus one plus one counters on it on your field. And then, of course, just the synergistic commons to work around with them. Dusk Mage letting you draw a card if it had a counter on it when it dies, and the Hagra Constrictor giving all your creatures with counters menace. Uh, you have even your removal, like Struggle for Skemfar, puts a plus one, plus one counter on one of your cards. You've got, you know, Tenored Inkcaster putting counters on stuff. Just really a Golgari aggro deck with a big plus one, plus one counter theme here. Then in white green, we have Lifeline. This is another deck focusing pretty heavily on Dungeons and Dragons cards, as you can see by the kind of core of the deck being the three copies of Trellisara here. Basically, if you were into mono white life gain decks when a Johnny's Pride Mate was still around in standard, this is going to be right up your alley. You've got three Trellisara, which is just a slightly better Johnny's Pride Mate if you can afford that green mana to cast her, allowing you to scry when you gain life as well. And you also have Celestial Unicorns, which is just like a slightly bigger a Johnny's Pride Mate. So this is definitely, I think, going to be one of the more popular of the decks because um, maybe it was just me, but I feel like when I used to queue into standard to get my dailies out of the way anytime a johnny's pride mate was in standard everyone was just playing mono white life gain it just felt like a very very popular mechanic so this white green life gain deck is going to be very very popular to those sorts of players and uh, yeah it's it's pretty much exactly what that theme has been doing for years now we have three more decks to look through of course, I will always timestamp the description if you want to skip to the gameplay, see what deck I'll be using here and all of that. But here we now have the green-red deck, Savage Lands. There are a few cards here that you'll recognize if you played any Gruul Landfall aggro decks in Standard. You have three Akum Hellhound, three Brushfire Elementals, just solid, solid cards if you have uh, Fetch Lands like Evolving Wilds, because then you can get Landfall twice in one turn, so you could attack with a Brushfire Elemental as a 5-5. So a really aggressive red-green deck here. We're also using some of the new D&D cards with Pack tactics these cards care about attacking with six power or greater during combat and if you do they get a bit of a buff the captain giving first strike the pack leader drawing a card and targnar giving your whole field plus one plus oh so really aggressive deck here with some great one and two mana landfall creatures some good pack tactics cards and uh yeah just a pretty good curve of some pretty aggressive creatures and of course, at the top end, you do have your own little bomby stuff like all the other decks. You have a Phylath here, the big landfall bomb that makes your plants, makes a bunch of plants and then starts making them massive. And Inferno of the Star Mounts, a new legendary dragon from D&D that's just a gigantic, uncounterable, hasting, fire-breathing, ridiculous dragon here. This should close out almost any game you draw it because in a deck as aggressive as this one, you'll probably have dealt a lot of damage to your opponent before you've cast this out, so they could very easily be down to six by the time you slam that on the board. Next up, in white-blue, we have another deck featuring mostly call time cards. It is the Sky Patrol deck featuring the Fortel mechanic heavily. The Fortel mechanic from call time being the two mana to exile it from your hand, and then you can cast it at a later time for a cheaper mana cost. So with Vega, you're drawing a card whenever you cast something you've foretold. You've got plenty of Fortel cards like the Cosmos Charger, Behold the Multiverse, Augury Raven, Starnheim Unleashed, Doom Scar, Saw It Coming, just a mountain of Fortel cards in the deck to get that extra Vega value off of. And other than that, it's kind of like a blue-white Flyers deck with a lot of controlling spells. Not quite just blue-white control, but pretty close, with Doom Scar as a Wrath effect, Journey to Oblivion as an Exile spell, Triple X spell as an Exile spell, Iron Verdict, 
dealing damage to tapped creatures. Um, basically, most of the removal in this deck, 3 Expel and 1 Iron Verdict, all cares about your opponent's creatures being tapped, so it's a lot of defensive removal rather than offensive removal. You can only use it if their creatures are like actively attacking you. So, definitely a slower, more controlling deck, but you have your own threats to place on the board. You have a Luminarch Aspirant and a ton of decent flying creatures like Vega, Cosmos Charger, Augury Raven, etc., and last but not least, Treasure Hunt here, another deck primarily focused on the newest cards, the Dungeons and Dragon cards. This one shows off the red-black color pairs mechanic for the set, which is Treasure Tokens. You focus around making a lot of Treasure Tokens and playing spells that are a little better if you spent treasure to cast them. So Kalein Reclusive Painter being kind of the build-around legendary creature for this color pair, creating a treasure when they come into play, and then when you cast any creature with treasure mana, those creatures will come into play with an additional plus one plus one counter on them. So a pretty aggressive deck here, aided a lot by the cards like Kalein making all of your other uh, creatures come out even bigger. You even have like Zorn here, which is just adorable artwork, but also a pretty fun effect there, doubling up all of your treasures. So you also have like Hired Hexblade, this will let you draw a card if you cast it with treasure. Just a lot of cards like that. Jaded Sellsword here, getting haste and first strike if you spent treasure on it. And some cards that will repeatedly make sure you keep getting treasure. Two Hoarding Ogres that give you treasure whenever they attack. And Goldspan Dragon, which gives you treasure whenever it attacks or becomes the target of a spell. As well as making your treasures tap for twice as much mana. So with that all out of the way, showing off all of the new decks, they all look pretty cool, pretty fun uh, overall. There's a few decks that I think are a little boring, a little bit, a little bit of a dud to me, like the uh, blue-black control center deck. I feel like it just doesn't have that much of a um, unique strategy to it. Same with the blue-red deck to me, just stuff that's been done for for a long time. But I suppose you could say the same about the red-green deck, and that's uh, probably my favorite one, um, mainly just because it looks like it's got some of the best aggressive landfall creatures and just looks like a really solid deck here. So I'm going to be running the green-red deck here, the Savage Lands deck, and I will be playing until I get my two wins to get my two random rare rewards. But I do think the vast majority of these decks are actually pretty cool. I think they're pretty good welcome decks, introductory decks to have available to every account on Arena. So I'm pretty excited for when they hit everyone's collection. So when all's said and done, I think this hand's a little bit slow. However, it's got some pretty powerful cards. Kazandu Mammoth just... Any turn that we're landfalling is going to attack in for a lot. We do need to draw another green source to get that on the board, though. We only have one right now. If we get this out and then scale the heights, that could lead to a really big mammoth coming in. And Owlbear in the late game keeps us fueled, lets us draw another card while getting a 4-4 Trampler onto the board. So I am going to keep this. Um, I play limited the vast majority of the time, just like draft and sealed. So my decisions on whether or not to mulligan are are weighted pretty heavily based on the general power level of draft and sealed decks, and a draft or sealed I would never mulligan this, but maybe in constructed you're supposed to mulligan here, because it's a lot more important to just get uh, a good curve and make sure you're playing cards every turn when uh, when every card in your deck is, is guaranteed to be a good card. But we are lucky here, we do draw into a couple very good cards to hit. I'm going to cast Targnar first here. Targnar being a two toughness creature means I can attack into this Ranger's Hawk. The three one is not going to do that so well. So we are against the black white venture deck that's going to focus around trying to dig into the Tomb of Annihilation. I'm going to go ahead and attack with Targnar here. And just get some damage in. In a lot of matchups, it would be worth considering just not attacking with that, so I have a 2-2 two, two to trade into the Fang Blade, but with a deck as aggressive as this red-green deck, I think I'm going to just allow my opponent to go off as much as they want, 
hit me for however much damage, and I'm just going to bank on my ability to outrace them and deal more damage than they can. So I'm going to let them just hop right into the Tomb of Annihilation here, get all that damage in just so I can crack back for a bunch of damage of my own, especially because next turn I will trigger pack tactics, so I'll be getting in for massive damage. I'll have a 5-5 five, five Mammoth, uh, a 2-2 two, two Targnar. When those both attack in, I'll be attacking with power 6 or greater. So Targnar is going to be a 3-2, and the Mammoth is going to be a 6-5. Six, uh, six, so that's like 9 damage there. Should be pretty good. Although a couple Malakir Blood Priests from my opponent are going to be able to block pretty well here. As well as, of course, gaining life every time those come to play. So that is not great for me. Opponent chooses the Lost Mine of Fandelver, so they, know get, they get to at least scry one here. Um, I could go for double Royal Eruption, just to get these Blood Priests out of the way. Mm, I could also just attack first, let them chump block however they want, and then Royal Eruption the Fang Blade. That seems fine to me. They can't kill the Mammoth here, even if they double block. And Targnar, we can double its power and toughness, so they have to double block Targnar if they want to kill Targnar. Otherwise, I can just spend the mana into its ability uh, to save it. Although, I suppose that'd be a little risky. I would take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, go down to 7 life. If uh, if they block with one and I dump all my mana into Targnar. I think I am just going to go for this all-out attack here, though. They block with a single Blood Priest. So would I rather save Targnar here? Or just trade with the Blood Priest, get a Hobgoblin Captain onto the board, and kill the Fang Blade? Yeah, I think because we have, like, Owl Bear in hand 2 coming up, let's just focus on clearing the board here on this attack. Now they can only hit us for 3, they can't venture into the dungeon unless they tap down their creatures. And next turn, of course, we'll be cracking in with at least 6 power, so the Hobgoblin Captain will have first strike now, which is great. So we'll take the 3. We should have a pretty great crack back next turn, especially if we draw land. A land would be beautiful. That'll give Kazandu Mammoth the plus two, plus two from landfall, as well as give us the ability to cast our Owl Bear and draw a card when we do so. And we do hit the land. Absolutely beautiful. So opponent did closing statement, kill our Hobgoblin Captain, get a counter on the Hawk. It's not awesome, but I like it much better than if they had killed the Mammoth. So I'm fine with that overall. And we do get in for that 5 damage, thanks to drawing the land there. One card in hand for our opponent, and another closing statement. This one going to hit our 4-4 four, four Trample. They get in for 3 in the sky here. The Blood Priest is all ready to chump block, which they'll have to do here with this Evolving Wilds, or they'll be dead. Because if I cast Evolving Wilds, well, if I play Evolving Wilds, that's 5 damage. If I crack it to grab another land, that's 7 damage. They'll go down to four life. Can't quite kill them if they go down to four, unless I play a bugbear or a scale the heights to put a plus one plus one counter on the mammoth. I think I'll go with the bugbear here. And then I still have the mana to royal eruption to do lethal damage to them after this. Alright, okay, they do block the mammoth, so I'm not going to crack the evolving wilds. We'll save that for another landfall trigger next turn. I will go ahead and just Royal Eruption, clear their only creature left on the board off, and pass the turn. Again, holding on to Evolving Wilds to get that extra damage, make sure I'm hitting for 8 damage next turn no matter what, and they do scoop them up there. So a really solid showing from the Gruul Landfall deck there, Kazandu Mammoth being an absolute beating. Definitely was helpful that our opponent chose to kill our other creatures before the mammoth because we were lucky enough to keep hitting the lands. It wasn't an unreasonable choice to make um, to kill the 4-4 trample instead of the Kazandu mammoth because they don't know that I could hit a land every single turn. If I ever miss a land, the 4-4 trample's better. But I think it was a little weird that they chose to kill the 3-1 instead of the Kazandu mammoth. And here, we don't have... Excuse me, we don't have any red mana. So we're not casting anything until turn 3, and we're not even casting that unless I draw another land. We're on the play here, so I can't even bake on drawing a mountain turn 1. I think I'm just going to mulligan this one. We do get a free mulligan 
in the weekly uh, midweek magic events, which is nice. It is pretty helpful. So I am going to keep this hand. It is, again, a little slow, I think, for this deck, but we've got the two mana 3-3, three, three, so that's a pretty solid start. And Scale the Heights here, letting us play an additional land the turn that we play that means we get to cast our five drops next turn. Actually going to be a pretty quick hand, all things considered. We're just not curving out with a creature every single turn because we're spending this turn playing more lands. So we're against a deck with a Thunderous Order in it. I'm not sure which deck has this in it. I haven't uh, memorized all the deck lists or anything. Another black-white deck here, so another black-white venture deck. Looks like we're just going to get into um, the same matchup as last time. This time with, I think, an even more impressive hand. This is just some ridiculous stuff from the green-red deck. Of course, Frog Hemoth here. Has a bunch of extra text at the bottom, but the important part here is that it's a 5-mana 4-4 four, four, Trample and Haste. Slamming in the turn it comes in and having Trample to trample over that 2-2 two, two, even if they block. And we of course have the ability to make our Werewolf pack a 5-3 Trample till end of turn, but they do have the closing statement here to clear that out. We've got a Haste creature here if I want to get in for more damage immediately. But this will just trade with the Orator. I think it's probably better to just drop an owl bear down. We hit for like 4 guaranteed damage here, put them down to 4 if I play the Bugbear. Because I don't see a world in which they'd want to... Yeah, no, they, they would take 4 damage either way because Trample. Yeah, we'll play the owl bear. Draw a card here. Ooh, and we draw a 1-drop creature. Very good draw. Get to expand our board even wider. And they're down to 4 now. Can exile any number of cards from their grave. That is what the giant wall of text on this is. Get to exile cards from their grave equal to the damage it dealt to them. And for each creature, it gets a plus and plus one counter. For each non-creature, you gain a life. So they had one non-creature card in grave, so we got to gain a life there. So another Malakir Blood Witch draining some life from us. Does mean they have a full field of blockers here, but now we can even get a haste creature out. Make sure we're going really wide. Can get a plus and plus one counter on a creature here. Make sure everything's at least three power so they can't uh, they can't not trade with any block they make. And then just slam in. The best blocks they can possibly make are trades. And they only have one death toucher for the two four fours. This may even be presenting lethal here. I haven't done the math. Math is indeed for blockers. They have three, four, five, six toughness out. They have six toughness. We have eight trample. Eight minus six is two, so that's two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight minimum. Yeah, that's it's just lethal. Actually, I did that math wrong. If they don't block the um, the tramplers, they actually stop more damage. So they could go three, three on trampler, and then these two on the non tramplers. That would be the least damage they could take. But this block also does leave them at one. So they survive with that block and probably get more of my creatures killed than they would have otherwise. Three cards in our opponent's hand. They're at one life here. We have another haste creature. This one can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less. So it's definitely possible the Brushfire Elemental can just get in for lethal even if they dump a bunch of stuff on the board. Let's see what they have here. They have one Malakir Blood Priest in Grave. We've exiled everything else with our Frog Hemoth. And there is the concession from our opponent leading the Gruul Landfall Aggro deck to a 2-0 victory and uh, getting us all of the prizes out of this midweek madness. And Devastating Mastery is the second rare reward. I didn't even notice what the first one was. It might have been gems, and that's why I didn't notice. But that will end today's video, the Midweek Magic Future Standard Pre-Cons event. Again, as I said before, I think these new decks are pretty cool. 
definitely nice to have in the collection for newer players. Definitely recommend giving the Midweek Magic event a little run, if nothing else, to get those two rare rewards. But these decks are also uh, pretty fun looking. Um, didn't have the most variety of gameplay there, just played against Dungeon Delving twice with Savage Lands each time. But uh, I, I think overall, a lot of these decks have some pretty cool tools available. Um, just a lot of fun stuff in general so there's a little something for everybody here whatever kind of deck you like even if you're heavily a drafter like myself you can kind of um look at these as like um kind of a hall of fame of some of the best draft strategies in the past year here you know green blue snow from Kaldheim, uh red white equipment that was a little bit of a strategy in zendikar and a little bit of a strategy in D D. You have white black uh, adventures from D and D, blue red spells from Strixhaven, uh, green black green black plus one plus one counters from Zendikar. It's uh, it's really cool to see kind of a you know blast from the past, all the best draft strategies lately. But that will end today's video. As always, if you watched all the way to the end, thank you very much for watching. Thank you all for all of the support lately, getting a ton of positive comments and just insane viewership on the. Adventures in the Forgotten Realms draft, so you can definitely expect more of that as always. Uh, I, I primarily focus on the limited gameplay, so I will always be drafting and doing seals of whatever the newest set is. And uh, yeah, that is going to end today's video, but thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.